is wonderful. song we'll be singing is at the cross.
We're going to be singing now, Trust and Obey. trust him and obey him we will be walking in heavenly sunlight we'll be singing heavenly sunlight
Let's turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19. I'll deal with one of my favorite passages. Uh, verse 10, the end of this passage is one of the most famous verses in the New Testament, one of the most popular verses. And uh, we're going to talk today about when Jesus seeks and saves the lost. If you found your place, let's stand for the reading of God's Word this morning. We're, we're at the end, basically, of, of what is called Luke's travel narrative. He's, he's recording Jesus on the way to Jerusalem to give his life on the cross and, and be buried and, and you know, be raised again three days later so that we could have salvation. And one of the last things that Jesus does is makes a stop in Jericho on his way to Jerusalem. And here we pick up the story. It says, he entered Jericho... And was passing through and there was a man by the name of Zacchaeus he was a chief tax collector and he was rich Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was and was unable because of the crowd for he was small in stature so he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him for he was about to pass through that way when Jesus came to the place, he stood up there and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. When they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Father, we thank you for your word and this precious event that happened in the life of Zacchaeus and, and in the ministry of Jesus that it's been written down for us so that we can see what exactly happens to someone when they come to know you as Lord and Savior and, and salvation comes into their lives and all the changes that are made. Father, we, we just pray, Lord, today that you would bring that change to someone's life here today who, who doesn't know you, that they might see these changes take place in their lives. And Lord, maybe... There's a Christian here who has grown cold and some of these changes have begun to uh, seem old and, and, and not fresh. But Lord, we, we know that you want a fresh and, and re new relationship with us each and every day. We pray that you would grant that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you know, if, if, you're, if you had been following along with Jesus' travel narrative, you'd know that in... Uh, Luke 18, he was talking to uh, this rich man who, you know, asked him who was his neighbor, and, and he was trying to justify himself, and, and he, he, he went away rejecting Jesus. And Jesus said in verses 24 and 25 of, of chapter 18, it says, And Jesus looked at him and said, How hard is it for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And, and, just, but, and he, that's, you I mean, think about that. A lot of people try to say, well, Jesus was talking about this needle gate. There's a gate in Jerusalem called the needle gate. And, and that, you know, it, it was, uh, had a low overhang in order for a camel to go through that needle gate, the camel had to kneel down and go through. But here's the problem with that, is that needle gate did not exist until the Middle Ages. So he, he, Jesus could not have been referring to that needle gate. That he's referring to a literal needle. He's, he's using some ridiculous language here to uh, say, you know, it's, it's really hard for some, for some rich people to get into heaven. But then we come to the story of Zacchaeus, and we find out, that Jesus can make it happen. What seems impossible, uh, you know, this, this rich man going to heaven actually happens here in the story of Zacchaeus, that Jesus can still accomplish what seems impossible to everybody else. 
And so Zacchaeus, uh, you know, the name Zacchaeus means righteous, but uh, he, he was not living up to his name. He, he was a tax collector. As a matter of fact, he was the chief tax collector. He was like the kingpin of all the tax collectors. And the way tax collecting worked in that day is Rome would say you need to collect this many taxes. If you collect more, then you can keep it. And so they would, you know, imagine if your local tax collector could just make up whatever tax bill they wanted to give you. Uh, you know, the, the state or the local government says, this is how much tax we need. And the tax collector, you know, they can send you the bill for whatever they want. And then they get to keep the extra. You can imagine what kind of a money racket that could be, right? And so uh, it, that's kind of the way he made his money. And he was despised by his fellow uh, Jews. They considered them traitors in, in league with Rome for collecting those taxes. And, and so, but, you know, Zacchaeus, uh, he, he encounters Jesus on this day. And when he does, uh, we, we see that, you know, when, when Jesus seeks and finds you, it brings about major changes in your life. That's, that's the main point for today. Is when Jesus seeks and finds you, because I mean, it looks like Zacchaeus is seeking Jesus, but what we really find out when we read this is Jesus is seeking Zacchaeus instead of Zacchaeus seeking Jesus. And, and when Jesus finds you, it brings about major changes in your life. So let's look at some of these changes here. Uh, the first thing that... that tends to happen to you is that you develop a, a childlike attitude toward Jesus. Uh, you want to know more about him. Look at verses 2 through 4 there. It says, And there was a man uh, called by the name of Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector and he was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was and he was unable because of the crowd for he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead, climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him where he was about to pass that way. It, it, it was considered very undignified in Jesus' day for a grown man to run. And not only that, but to climb up into a sycamore tree so you could see. And, and, and that shows that he was just willing to lay aside that dignity, that, you know, that adult dignity, I guess you'd say, and, and just be like a child. A child doesn't care about that. You, you take a child to a parade at Disney, what do they want to do? Pick me up so I can see, right? You know, they, they don't care to let people know that, that they're kids, you know, that they just, they just want to see the parade, right? And, and that's what was happening here. And, and of course, you get to a certain point and they get, no, don't pick me up. That's embarrassing. You know, don't pick me up to see that parade. People will know I'm a kid. And, and that happens. That has happened in, in my life, but I won't say who it was. Uh, got too big to be picked up. Uh, then, but he, he you got to wonder. It says he wanted to know who Jesus was. You know, what, what was it that drove Zacchaeus up that sycamore tree? You know, I, I wonder if he'd heard about Matthew, who was also a tax collector and, and was one of Jesus' followers. He probably knew Matthew since, since he was the chief tax collector. And, and here's Matthew. He's, he's seen his, his life change and he's probably heard the stories of, of Jesus eating with tax collectors and sinners and, and he's wanted to see what, all about him. We also see that uh, it, right before he comes into Jericho at the end of chapter 18, he, he heals blind Bartimaeus. Blind Bartimaeus on the way into Jericho. Remember he yells out, David, you know, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And, and he won't be quiet. And Jesus heals him. And you know how fast word gets around when something like that happens. And, and I imagine that the word about Zacchaeus made it into Jericho before Jesus did. People were running and telling, look what, look what happened at, just right outside the gates here. Jesus has healed this blind man. And so it says that he wanted to know who Jesus was. And so he was pursuing him in this childlike faith. And he, he, he left his dignity behind. He, he, was, he, wasn't, he was untroubled by concern for dignity. You see, when, when you have this childlike faith, you don't mind asking people for help. Uh, in, in Matthew 18... We, we see Jesus talking about this. 
That, it says, At that time the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a, a child to himself and, and set him before them. And he said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as a child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. What, what Jesus is saying is that you just you got to not worry about what people think. A lot of kids just don't worry about what people think sometimes, do they? When they, when they see something they want, they go after it. They, 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 they humble themselves. They ask for help. You know, you get a little kid, and they, they get up in the morning. They want breakfast, right? You know, are, are, are they going to cook the breakfast? No, it's, you know, it's dad, grandpa, grandma. Will you make me some breakfast? You know, pour the bowl of cereal. Will you help me pour the milk? You know, they, they, they don't care to ask for help. There's some humility there. And that's what Jesus is talking about, is a, is a childlike faith. Not, not a childish faith where we always have to have our way, but a childlike faith where we don't mind asking God for help. You develop this childlike attitude toward Jesus. Second thing, when Jesus seeks and saves the lost, is that you realize that in spite of all seeking, it is Jesus who finds you. The, you know, the Bible tells us that no one naturally seeks God. Uh, Zacchaeus wasn't nece didn't necessarily know who Jesus was. He, it says he was trying to see who Jesus was. But he was seeking something in his life. Uh, uh, Romans chapter 3, uh, verses 10 and 11 tells us that there is none righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. So, you know, people may come in here curious, trying to find out the meaning of life. It's not necessarily that they're seeking God on their own. Maybe God is working in their life because uh, when someone is actually seeking, it's a work of the Holy Spirit. In John 6, Jesus said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on that day. You know what's happened in Zacchaeus' life here? Is that the Holy Spirit has already been working and moving in his life. He's gone on ahead. And you know what? When you, you know, we need to be obedient to share our faith. And what we need to do is trust when we share our faith that the Holy Spirit has gone on ahead of us and been working in that person's life. And be faithful to share our faith. And that's what's happened in Zacchaeus' life. The Holy Spirit is working in his life. You need to find out who Jesus is. And so he goes up in that tree. Then, the next change that comes about is you experience the joy of receiving Jesus. Look at verse 6. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. You know, Jesus said, you know, you, you, come on down. When I was reading this, it was so hard to read it the way the verse read there in verse 5. Zacchaeus, hurry and come down for today I'm going to stay at your house. How did I want to read that? Zacchaeus, you come down. Like the song, right? It was just in my head that way. But here he gets this joy. He answers the call of Jesus to come down and be with him. It says that he received him gladly. There's, there was this joy of receiving Jesus. And, and this joy, it's, it's immediate. As soon as you receive Jesus, there's joy in your life. It, it, you, you can't take it away. It, it, you know, it, it's there. It's immediate. And, and what we find out here is that the, the host becomes the guest. You, you, you invite Jesus into your heart, into your life, and, and you, you know, imagine your heart is, is like a home, okay? And, and you invite Jesus into your house, and Jesus says, come on, let's go to the kitchen. And he starts cooking the meal and starts preparing the, the banquet for you and the supper. And, and you find out that when you invite Jesus in, you actually become his guest. And he takes care of you and nourishes you. And that's what uh, Zacchaeus is finding out here. Is it, it brings joy to his life to, to invite Jesus to come in. So that's, you, you, you experience this joy of receiving Jesus. Well, then you realize that not everyone's going to be happy about it. 
In verse 7 it says, When they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, He has gone to be with a, the guest of a man who is a sinner. You see, when you begin to receive, when you, you, when you receive Jesus and start following Him, people are going to talk. And, and, and lost people especially, they don't understand grace. That that you it doesn't that your past does not matter. That that Jesus reaches out and he saves you just the way you are. As the song says, just as I am without one plea. What what could Zacchaeus have, have pled to Jesus? Lord, I, I'm I'm not the worst tax collector. No, he 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 didn't do that. He he, he came to Jesus just the way he was. And people didn't like that. They don't understand grace because you see, most of the people are trying are, are on a system of works, and if you start, you know, getting the benefits of being with Jesus and, and didn't have to necessarily work for it, you just surrendered to Him and gave your life to. Him, people don't don't understand that because it it shows that their system is wrong, and they they begin to talk about it. And when they begin to talk, here's another change that happens in verse 8 is you bring forth the fruit of repentance. Re regeneration is kind of the theological term for being born again. It's, it's that God gives you a brand new heart. He, he, he makes you, as, as first, or 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. He gives you a brand new heart. And things begin to change in your life. This regeneration, it brings about repentance. Now, what is repentance? Repentance is a, is a change of direction, a change of mind. What, what, what direction has Zacchaeus been going Look at verse 8. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, half of my possessions I will give to the poor, and I will defraud anyone. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, the, the, what he's saying there is, Yeah, I've defrauded people. I will give back four times as much. He, he's, he's been cheating people, and the repentance is to make it right. Let's turn around and start going the other way. And, and so, but this repentance, it's, it's, a ref, it's a fruit of being born again. Repentance expresses itself as fruit. Uh, Matthew 3 8 says, Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance, is what John the Baptist said. If I go out here uh, to one of these oak trees, And I, I want to see some fruit on that oak tree. Can I just start uh, clipping oranges onto that oak tree? I, I could, but is that oak tree really bearing fruit? What's going to happen to those oranges? They're going to rot. Or, you know, they're going to rot on the tree. You, you see, you cannot just say, well, I'm going to have fruit. I'm going to start living a Christian life and that will prove to me that, that I'm saved. Now you have to be saved and get a new heart and then that new heart causes you to produce the fruit. It, it becomes automatic. It, it's like you actually become an orange tree and then you can produce oranges, right? That, that's, that's what it, it's all about here. Is this is fruit of repentance. It, it's fruit. It, he, he's had a changed heart. And a changed life. And so he's bringing forth this fruit of repentance. And you begin to do that. And then finally, you go from spiritual poverty to spiritual riches. Salvation comes through, spiritual, through the spiritual bankruptcy process of faith. What's, what's happened here? Because Jesus told him in verses 9 and 10, uh, today salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. Well, how does the New Testament tell us that you become a son of Abraham? 
Is it by natural descent? Are, are you a son of Abraham just because you were born in a certain place in a certain time? Galatians 3 uh, and verse uh, 7 says, Therefore be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. Jesus is talking about the faith that he's expressed here. And, and, and what is faith? It's not works. It's the opposite of works. It's, faith is the one thing that God could use that would not be a work. That, you, that would not be you earning your salvation. It, it, it's, it's like a, you, know, you offer a beggar some, some money. And the beggar receives it by faith. Did they, did they do anything to work for it? No. And, and, and he, what Zacchaeus has experienced here is the very first beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He, he's declared spiritual bankruptcy, if you will. Zacchaeus is not saying, you know, I haven't been too bad. You know, Lord, you know, I, I'm... I'm 50% righteous and I just need you to make up the other 50% what, no, what he's doing here is Lord, I have no righteousness of my own and I need all of my righteousness to come to you and he, he, he responds to Jesus in faith and then Jesus makes this pronouncement that for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost these spiritual riches are provided because Jesus became poor to seek the lost. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 says, for, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you might become rich. What kind of life did Jesus have before he left heaven? He was one with the Father. He was right there in the very throne room of heaven, receiving the praise of the angels. You know, all, all, think about all that he had. What did he do? He, he, he left all that, came to be born in, into a family that, that was so poor, he was born in a manger. They, they, you know, they didn't have a lot. He, he grew up. Uh, the Bible says he grew up without a place, or, or, or he, you know, he, he didn't have a place to lay his head. He, Jesus didn't have a home. He, he wandered from place to place, depended on other people for places to stay. He left all of that and became poor, so that he would eventually make his way. To an old rugged cross and lay down his life on that cross and pay not only for the sins of Zacchaeus but for the sins of me and for you and, and anybody we, he paid the sins for everybody if you just receive him in faith what happens Spiritual riches that you you cannot even imagine. Uh, as a matter of fact, Ephesians one, as Ephesians one three, he's he's blessed us in the heavenlies with every spiritual blessing. How many blessing? How many spiritual blessings do you have because of following Jesus? Every one of them. A lot of times we we don't realize what we have. Jesus loves us and he came to seek and to save that which was lost. And when he saves you, he doesn't just say, oh, you, you can barely make it in the door to heaven now. He gives you all of his spiritual riches, all of, all of his righteousness. And you are a brand new person. And so as we sing a song of invitation this morning, under the authority of God's word. That's what I want to offer to you. Jesus is saying, if you'll come to me, I'll give you this righteousness. You can be saved. Let's pray.
Father, we thank you so much for the price that was paid on the cross for our sins. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the story of salvation that's in your word, Lord, that you can save anybody. There's not a single person in, in this world who's beyond the reach of your grace. Lord, if, if, if they'll just surrender to you and gladly receive you by faith, make you Lord of their lives, they can have this wonderful gift of salvation and be brand new creation. Lord, we just ask that you would work in our hearts and lives today and help us. Lord, if there's one here who needs to receive that gift, may today be the day. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand as we sing a song of invitation. If the Lord's dealing with your heart for any reason, would you please come? Wednesday night we're going to have a cookout at 6 o'clock with the kids and grown ups and anybody wants to come I can make some pretty good hot dogs so <laughs> just come on out uh, Brother Terry would you dismiss us please our Heavenly Father we thank you this morning for an opportunity to be again in your house Lord God we thank you for this message Lord we pray that they be one here today and don't know you. That they won't leave this building until they do know you. Father, we come to you this morning saying, Lord, we realize that we can do nothing without you. And Lord, we just want to say this morning we need you every hour of every day. Father, be with everybody if we head to our home, Lord, and give us a safe journey. Bring us back at the next appointed time, Lord. Ask the blessing upon this church and each individual. And we pray it all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen.